Hello, this is Angela Dansby on behalf of Plant Science Post for CropLife International. I'm here today with Martina Newell McLaughlin, Director of Research for Higher Education of the Abu Dhabi Education Council. Welcome, Martina. Today we're going to talk about uh, biotechnology and, and its uh, ability to produce nutritionally enhanced crops. Martina, I'm curious to know how biotechnology has been used to improve the nutrition of crops. Uh, so biotechnology approaches are being used to improve the nutritional characteristics of crops in several uh, areas. So at the macronutrient level, for example, work is being done on improving the protein and amino acid characteristics, especially increasing the essential amino acids in several crops. Uh, work is also being done on improving complex uh, carbohydrates and improving fiber content. Uh, in addition, work is being done on improving the um, essential oils, the healthy oils, if you like, in, in various crop plants. And in fact, that's where the first products that have been approved uh, were a lot of the focus is. On the, at the micronutrient level, quite a bit of work has also been done. And in fact, one of the most famous um, areas that most people have heard about is research that's been done on a product called golden rice increasing the basic carotene to offset vitamin A deficiency. In addition, work has been done on increasing um, the good phytochemicals <laughs> uh, in crop plants. They're also looking at mechanisms to reduce allergens and toxins and uh, other negative components that are in crop plants, for example, like gluten for individuals that have celiac disease. So the whole spectrum of areas that nutrition is, is um, of where you're looking from a nutritional perspective and proven crop plant, biotech research is being done on these areas. Well, among these wonderful concepts, which have real-life examples commercially available today? Yes. So some examples that are already have been uh, commercialized are the improved um, oil content, and primarily one of the main products that that's being looked at is in soybeans. So two products that have already been approved. Uh, one is improved um, high-quality oil that's used for cooking. So this is what's called a monounsaturated fatty acid. Uh, this particular uh, oil variety is much more stable than the polyunsaturated fatty acid. So it's more heat resistant. It's also more oxidation resistant. It doesn't become rancid as easily. In addition, it requires little or no post-refining, so you don't need hydrogenation. Hydrogenation introduces trans fatty acids, which of course are not good as they increase cholesterol. Uh, so this uh, particular crop variety has already been approved and is on the market, and you've got uh, up to 80% improvement in the uh, content of that high-quality oil. Uh, another um, oil that people often hear about is the omega-3 fatty acids, and these are have positive effects across the whole range of uh, nutritional. So, for example, they're good for cardiovascular disease. They help reduce thrombosis. Uh, they're found to be protective against cancer, protective against arthritis, and can enhance cognitive capability. So, these fats would be called um, brain oil. <laughs> uh, right now, we are dependent on fatty fish to get these particular omega-3 fatty acids. And there literally isn't enough fish in the ocean to supply the world's needs. But by taking a gene from an algal source and putting it into soybeans or canola, you can produce in one acre of soybeans the equivalent of these omega-3 fatty acids as in 10,000 salmon. So there is a very good land-based source without having to kill all the salmon to get access to this fatty acid. There's also work being done on increasing, uh, as I said, the um, production of uh, basic carotene in rice. Now, this has been a, a rather interesting uh, story <laughs> because vitamin A deficiency is really a disease of the poor in developing countries. Uh, it is estimated that uh, up to two million children go blind each year from lack of access to this vitamin. But what some people sometimes forget is it also plays a significant role in the immune system and it's absolutely crucial for growth and development. 
So lack of this vision and in addition to leading to blindness, it also kills between two to three million people each year, mostly, again, children and women. Now, by introducing this basic carotene gene, you can get sufficient amount of uh, vitamin A, go vitamin A each day by just consuming 40 grams of this golden rice. And yes, it is still not being approved. And a recent paper has determined in the period of time that this has been under consideration, uh, 1.5 million children um, probably have died because of lack of access uh, to this particular uh, source of uh, vitamin A. And this, uh, to me, is it's, uh, really dreadful that you're looking at a real need versus a hypothetical risk. And uh, you're, which is leading to lost lives as opposed to any potential risk that all of the research that has been done into the safety of biotechnology clearly indicates that this is not a risk. Given the potential of such biotech foods to improve public health, why is there any pushback on them? Isn't their safety well substantiated? Yeah. And uh, quite frankly, much of the work that has been done to date has indicated that, in fact, biotechnology has contributed to the development of healthier foods. In fact, one of the longest studies that was done, it was done in, 210 by, uh, sorry, in 2010 by the EU, where they looked at 25 years of research, looking at over 130 research projects, projects by 500 research groups all over the EU. And they found there is no scientific evidence associating uh, biotechnology with higher risk for food and feed safety uh, than there is for conventional plants and animals. There's many long-term and multi-generational studies, up to five generations of rats, for example. They demonstrated that GM plants are nutritionally equivalent to their non-GM counterparts and can be safely used in food and feed. Uh, we right now have eaten about two trillion meals with biotech ingredients. And there hasn't been a single substantiated case of ill health. There's been over a thousand peer-reviewed studies, and all of them have concluded that uh, biotechnology food products are safe. And one of the most recent was actually done in um, uh, UC Davis, where they looked over the seed supply to animals since biotech products were first introduced. About 93% of all um, animal seed is now from biotech sources. And looking re literally at 100 billion animals, <laughs> there wasn't uh, a single unfavorable trend in livestock health or productivity over that period of time. So to me and to all of our peers, that's pretty conclusive that there really isn't an issue with this. And much of the misinformation that's out there is fair tactics and has no basis in science. Uh, they say you're entitled to your opinion, but not to your facts. And the facts clearly show that, they, that biotechnology, um, products of biotechnology are inherently safe. Given this tremendous safety record of biotech crops, how can regulatory and public acceptance be improved? What is it yeah, going to so take? I think uh, when you start to look at the actual introduction of traits that are of value to the, to the consumer, that I think they're going to have a big difference. So the example I just gave you there of the high omega-3 uh, soybeans and canola. That can directly relate to the consumer. This is something that they will see as immediately of value to them from a health perspective. Uh, likewise, mm -hmm. there's a variety of apples that have just been produced where you have reduced browning. And in fact, you've increased the amount of what's called polyphenols. And polyphenols are actually par powerful antioxidants and can help with, with uh, consumer health as well. But because the apple looks more aesthetically pleasing, again, you'll have less waste and you'll have more incentives, and especially for children, uh, uh, to eat uh, cut apples. So these types of products that consumers can directly relate to, to me, once you get real consumer demand for something, it will have offset some of the negative, uh, um, shall we say, uh, fear mongering <laughs> that occurs mm -hmm. in certain groups that are anti-biotechnology. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think as well, some of the new technologies that are coming in right now, such as, for example, what's called genome editing, where you can introduce very small changes into the G 
machines that already exist within the vacation, within, excuse me, the craft, that consumers will be more accepting of this. Um, how, how great do you feel the potential of biotech crops is to improve public health? Mm -hmm. The various products that are coming down the line right now, uh, you know, if you were to take the older methods of conventional breeding, many of those you couldn't even do. Uh, for example, uh, you would not be able to produce the uh, high quality oils that I talked about in soybean and canola without taking the biotech approach. And in some instances, quite frankly, without biotechnology, we're not going to have a number of crops. Say, for example, uh, your morning orange juice, that may disappear without biotechnology. Uh, because right now, uh, citrus production is being impacted by a disease called citrus greening. And this particular um, uh, insect source cannot be controlled there literally is no mechanism out there to control this bacteria at this point in time. So what, what they're doing is they're ripping up whole citrus orchards, especially in Florida where there's a high level of infection, and they're spraying to control the vector. Uh, but they're fighting a losing battle. But yet with biotech, there are two genes from spinach that you could put into the citrus and protect it. Uh, against this particular bacteria. So here, you, the future may be biotech oranges are no oranges. <laughs> Similar well, that's certainly great. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's here to move public like, acceptance. <laughs> yeah, I think that would increase public acceptance. Same for grapes. <laughs> uh, there is a disease called Pierce's disease, and, and this is caused um, a, by a bacteria that's carried by uh, an insect called a glassy ring sharper shooter. And again, no control for this. <laughs> Uh, so, again, your future may be um, biotech wine or no wine. <laughs> <laughs> I know what my decision would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's instances like this where you have very specific uh, interest by, by the consumer and where you're in a, literally in a situation of the, the potential elimination <laughs> of a crop <laughs> or having the biotech version. Um, jumping over to the other side of crop protection and looking at crop protection products uh, or pesticides, um, how, do, how do those products enhance crop health and thereby nutrition um, and the availability of nutritious foods as well? There are lots of, of insects and lots of diseases and lots of other creatures out there that also want to eat our nutritious crops. <laughs> so we have to use all mechanisms. Uh, to control these um, other things <laughs> that are competing uh, for our crop products. So if you have uh, effective mechanisms for controlling pests and diseases, whatever mechanism it is that you're going to use to do that, then clearly uh, you're in a position to increase productivity, to increase the amount of, of these crops and crop products, and by having more of them, they, should, they will cost less and will be more available to consumers, and especially for those that are on tight incomes, it's really important that we try to have as much uh, uh, safe and nutritious food available um, around year round. And these crop protection products, whatever source you're using, will help with making uh, high quality, highly nutritious food more affordable for individuals. Um, in some countries, up 75% of the crop is lost through pests and diseases. And if we weren't controlling those, then clearly you're looking at, and indeed this does happen, especially in Africa, you're looking at potential famine without use of these products to ensure that we have a safe and nutritious food supply. Well, needless to say, the future of plant science and nutrition is extremely promising. Martina, thank you so much for your time. Yes. You're most welcome. Thank you.